Dr. Timothy Ryder, accused of murdering his wife Anne, resumes this afternoon. Defense attorneys are expected to attack the credibility of star prosecution witness Professor Charles Lattimore. Lattimore's discovery of stolen hospital files has been a key element of the state's case. You were in Tim Ryder's house when you first saw this photograph. Was the occasion of your visit? When Dr. Ryder was first arrested for the murder of his wife, I decided to write a book about the case. Sort of like the lawyer who chases the proverbial ambulance. Once you decided to write your book, you contacted the defendant. How did he respond to your request for an interview? He was, uh, he was very cooperative. And after the first contact was made? Dr. Ryder and I spent a lot of time together over the next several months. The fact is, Dr. Ryder opened his entire life to you. Isn't that correct? Yes. Tell me something. After all the time you spent with Dr. Ryder, did you consider him a friend? I still do. A verdict was reached today in a case that has made national headlines as Dr. Timothy Ryder was found guilty of second-degree murder. Professor Lattimore, the man you call a friend is going to prison because of your testimony. How do you feel about that?
I figured you could use a drink. Oh, cheers. Thank you very much. Mike, still haven't told me what you thought of the book. Good, great, very interesting. Real page turner. Mm. Of course, you got a couple things wrong. Like? Like. All right, right here. Lieutenant Mike Dowling, the detective assigned to the case, was a well-known figure in a small college town. Okay, his predilection for expensively tailored Italian suits had earned him an affectionate nickname. Dapper Dowling? Thank you. Well, at least I use the word affectionate. Can I help it if I'm the only one around here with a lot of style? Lattimore, <clears throat> welcome back from sabbatical. Henry. <clears throat> Henry, how wonderful to see you. I read your new book. It's, um, fun. Of course, I like your little whodunits a lot better. Well, you know what they say, we can't all be Shakespeare. Here, give it to me, I'll sign it for you. Oh, thank you. Well, what the hell, the money's good, right? Paperback rights, mini-series down the line. So, I hear congratulations are in order. Well, that's very generous of you. I think he's talking about your promotion, Henry. Oh, that. Yeah. Youngest man ever to head up the English department. Am I right? Mm-hmm. <laughs> Cute. <laughs> A lot of things have changed since you left Charles. Once you get settled, we should sit down and talk. Good seeing you, Henry. What was that all about? Guess you haven't seen Laura since you've been back. I did send her an invitation. I thought it might be better to get reacquainted in a public place. Know what I mean? No, that's not such a bad idea, seeing as how last time she came at you with a waffle iron. Well, she did have her reasons, didn't she? Mm-hmm. Mm. Have you heard from her? Hmm? Yeah. Ellen and I had her over the house uh, a few months ago. Alone? Excuse me, Professor Lattimore. Mm. Would you sign my book? Yes, certainly. Um, to... Francesca Lavin. Mm. I'm taking your creative writing classes, too. Hmm? The art of the thriller. Oh, God. Not that crud again. Well, you don't seem to think much of crime writers. Well, it's just that they fail to realize that most people get murdered right in their own living room, and usually by someone very close to them. I mean, no grand schemes, no premeditation, just the heat well, of Well, Mike, uh, I'm happy to leave real-life murder up to you. I mean, the fictional kind any day of the week. Miss Lavin, I'll see you in class. Nice guy. Married, Bill. Actually, Mrs. Lattimore has petitioned for divorce. Oh, you do your homework. Just enough to know the professor's strengths. And his weakness. Bye-bye, Lieutenant. Good luck. <clears throat> Professor Lattimore. Glad you could make it. Just think you've only been back a few hours. What is that? What? That hard line running from your lower lip. Keeping your teeth clenched for a year will do that, you know? Don't flatter yourself, Charlie. I wrote letters. I called you. I even sent you a telegram. You never, ever responded. That's not true. I kept in touch. Through a divorce attorney? That's hardly what I call keeping an open mind. I don't think this is the place to get into this. Okay. Let's have dinner. Why? So you can tell me it was all a terrible mistake. The girl meant nothing to you. It was the stress of the book that made you do a... Something like that. Charlie, you forget something. I teach this stuff for a living. I know these stories inside out. Would it make any difference if I told you that there hasn't been anyone else? What do you want from me, Charlie? I don't Here, let me sign your book. When I agreed to the separation, I thought, well, maybe she's right. Maybe the whole thing has gone south. Then I realized I didn't feel like that at all. Here, read it. Charlie, this is difficult to say, but I'm seeing someone. Well, that's understandable. I mean, I didn't expect you to twiddle your thumbs for a year. Well, actually, it's pretty serious. Serious? I think so. Uh, okay, well, uh, do I know him? I mean, what's his name? 
Hey, where have you been? Did you just get here? <laughs> a few minutes ago. <laughs> I, I don't believe this. <laughs> well, as I told you, Charles, a lot of things have changed around here. I wanted to tell you before I... I guess you were otherwise engaged. This was a terrible mistake. Let's go. Thank you for the book, Charlie. Thanks for the book. Mm -hmm. Hey, could be worse. Oh. I don't know. Let's think about it. I mean, what does she see in this guy? Well, I hear he keeps his hands off the students. Before I begin teaching, of course, I, uh, I'd like to get to know something about my students. I usually do this by asking a few questions, uh, kind of an informal survey. You can answer by uh, raising your hand. Okay, first question. How many of you have ever committed murder? Don't be shy, just raise your hand if you've ever killed somebody. You guys don't get out much. Okay, next question. How many of you have ever thought about killing someone? You are John Steinmetz. <laughs> Tell me, John, haven't you ever fantasized about murdering someone? Hmm? Your older sister or that piano teacher you had in the third grade? Oh, come on, John. How about the guy who sold you that berry? There have been a few professors I would have liked to kill. Uh, this is good. I put John on the spot now. He wants to put me six feet under. That's very good. Okay, here's something for you to look at. These are some of the typical weapons used in the mystery and detective novel. The pearl handle revolver. A vial of poison. The French garage. Each one ideal for committing the most dastardly of crimes. Here's a quote. A thriller is a piece of writing whose plot development depends on violence. But here's another quote. A writer is at his most capable and confident when he deals with things which are familiar to him. Now this leaves us with a little bit of a problem. As no one in this room has ever committed a murder. Most of you say you've never even considered it. No. But yet, <laughs> you all want to write thrillers, which depend for their effectiveness on acts of extreme violence. Now, short of becoming actual murderers, where does this leave us? Professor Lattimore, your hand! Stop! Oh! Oh! Charlie Lattimore's rule number one. A mystery writer must be like a magician. Always keep the reader thinking about the inconsequential while taking his mind off the bigger picture. I have to return these to the drama department. Anyway, as this course goes on, we'll learn all the tricks of the trade. So that by the end of this semester, each one of you should be able to construct a fairly decent thriller. But to give you another quote, Plots, MacGuffins, and such are like carpentry. Making a wood cabinet into a work of art is something that carpenter cannot be taught. As writers, you have to get inside the head of each of your characters. In a mystery story, that means not just understanding the victim of the crime, but also the killer. The first assignment of this semester, due in three weeks, is simply this. Plan a perfect murder. I want to see in ten pages or less a whodunit in which you are the villain. In order to throw off the police, you should have an airtight alibi as well as an alternate suspect who can take the blame for your actions. <coughs> of course, the poet W.H. Auden claimed there was no such thing as the perfect murder. He said, 
guilt. Man's need to atone was the traitor within the gates that would always give him away. But who knows? Maybe the guy was wrong. Yes. What about all the homicides that go unsolved each year? Wouldn't Auden consider them perfect murders? No, just sloppy detective work. Auden's point was that no matter how small, there was always a calling card left behind. It just took a good pair of eyes to find it. Like yours? Excuse me? Weren't you the only one who could see Dr. Ryder's calling card? Well, uh, I just got lucky, thank you. Uh, I'll see you all next Wednesday. Uh, Professor Lattimore. Uh, Robert Miner. I'm a big fan of your work. In fact, um, you're, the, you're the main reason that I transferred here to Hempstead. Well, I hope you enjoy the class. I will. Murder is sort of a hobby of mine. Oh. What is all this, anyway? Uh, it's, um, it's research. See, when I found that you were writing about the Ryder case, I became obsessed with it. It was really one of the most interesting murders of the past ten years. Don't you agree? It's not exactly the way I'd put it. <laughs> Do you mind if I ask you a few questions? Well, about to tell you the truth, after three years, I'm pretty burned out on But it's related to the course. See, the Ryder case proves that all was wrong. I mean, there is such a thing as a perfect murder. Uh, I'm not following you. Well, the person who killed Mrs. Ryder pulled off the perfect crime. I take it you don't think her husband did it? Couldn't have. Why not? Well, the murderer duplicated the M.O. of the cult killers down to the minutest detail. Only the police knew about the pentagrams carved in the victim's heads. Ryder was chief surgeon at the same hospital where the murder victims died. If you read my book, you'd know that those autopsy reports were stolen from hospital files, proving, proving that Ryder knew about the pentagram. If he took the files? I found them at his home. Maybe somebody planted them there. I think you're moving into the world of fiction now. You see, uh, what I wanted to know was, uh, could this be my perfect murder paper? You mean prove in three weeks that my book is totally invalid? But I, I have nothing but the greatest respect for your uh. work. I, I just don't think this case against Ryder hangs up. And if you could confirm your suspicions, you know I'd feel compelled to do something about it. Not a bad way to kickstart a writing career now, is it? Well, I admit some of those thoughts have crossed my mind, but there's another reason. Mm -hmm. uh, suddenly I read between the lines of your book. What's that? In spite of all the evidence, you're still not convinced that Ryder did it. Am I right? <clears throat> Do the assignment your way, Mr. Miner. Just make sure you surprise me, that's all. Oh, I will. Paradise by the Death Board Light by Linda Jo Jennings. Tubular bondage in the back seat, 55 miles per hour in an unmoving car. Innocence lost on beer stained vinyl. Green light gives way to yellow. Caution. Watch out! You've run my red light! Agony. Misery. Bliss. Awakening. My very own love canal. Bad Joni Mitchell on AM. 92.5. Was it good for you? Was I even there? Help me. I think I'm falling in love with you. Thank you. Wow, that was refreshing. Thank you, Linda Joe. Uh, it's getting pretty late, so if no one else wants Wild to recite. Wild nights! Wild nights! Wild nights! Where I with thee, wild nights should be our luxury. Futile the winds to a heart in port. Done with the compass, done with the charts. <gasps> Rowing in Eden. Ah, the sea. Might I but moor tonight in thee? Thank you. 
My heartfelt thanks. To Emily Dickinson. Thank you, class. That's all for now. Hmm. So, how about it then? I already have a date, Charlie. Come on, little love potter. Really? How do you know? I know. Well, you're wrong. Henry is... Mm -hmm. Overly ambitious? A little plastic? Lacking a soul? Completely trustworthy. Aren't you ever going to forgive me? Do you know why I left you? Yes. If you think it's the girl, you're wrong. What was it then? You changed. Writing that book did something to you. What exactly? I mean, am I supposed to guess? Why don't you just try thinking about it? I, I will, I promise. But unless you talk to me, how will I know when I figure it out? All right, you win. If you like, we can grab a bite to eat sometime. There, does that make you happy? Static. Oh, good. Well, good night. Okay, good night. Sweet dreams. Mm. Got a minute, Lamar? Never mind. Yeah, it's about this assignment of yours. Don't you think you're pushing it a little bit? I can just see next year's catalog. Come to Hampstead. Get your first, second, third degree in murder. Oh, is that what's really bothering you? Lamar told me you two spoke last night. Oh, we've been married for over ten years, Henry. I'm not going to give her up without a fight. Yeah, well, you do what you have to, Lamar. There's just one thing you should know. What's that? I never lose. That's funny. I thought you were going to say something human, like how much you love Laura. <laughs> I'm going to make your life very difficult, Charles. Yeah. That might interest you. Good characters are haunted by the past, just as real people are. They have personal problems unrelated to the plot, just as real people do. Broken love affairs, bankruptcies, shameful deeds they want to forget. The most powerful plots are based on characters in conflict with themselves. Usually, it's the internal conflict, the tug of war that goes on inside a character that makes a story more compelling. Forget me nots, your favorites. Believe me, Charlie, I've long since forgotten. Uh, what about lunch? Hmm? Charlie, we've already had lunch twice this week. Don't you have any work to do? I got all your favorites. I have to grade these papers before tomorrow. And besides, I brought my own lunch. Oh. It's a shame about all those papers you have to sign, isn't it? Let me see, what are you eating these days for lunch? Mmm, smells delicious. Mm. Oh, yummy, 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 yummy. Mm. Mm. You're too much. I thought you were too busy for lunch. There's more than enough for three. Would you care to join us? Hmm? When plotting a suspense story, it's a good idea to start with a double strand. The crime filament and the man-woman relationship. The possibility of romance always gives a story an added element of suspense. Sex and love provide the most <laughs> common motive for murder. Ooh. You want to constantly place a series of little questions in your reader's mind. What will so-and-so do next, the reader should ask. One of the worst mistakes you can make as a mystery writer is to leave all your revelations for the last page. When the reader finally finds out who the villain is, you should have left enough clues along the way for him to say, sure, 
one night. At the same time, you can't make your mystery too transparent. It's impossible to overstate the importance of research to a writer. Murder becomes much more believable when it is rooted in a sense of reality. My old friend Tilden here has agreed to let us watch an autopsy. How did he die? It uh, looks like a suicide. He jumped out the bedroom window of his apartment. What is that? That's glass. From the window? Uh, this glass is from the bifocals. They found a pair near the body. This means it probably wasn't suicide. Well, most suicides take off their glasses before they jump. I mean, you really don't want 20 20 vision at a time like that. That's right. Uh, which is an indication that we have to look a little closer. Very good, Robert. Oh. Professor Lanaval. Yes. I forgot this. Your wife asked me to give it to you. Charlie. Mike! Mike, where were you? Sorry, I'm late. There was a hold up at a convenience store. <laughs> now, don't worry about it. Tilden's autopsy was enough for one day. Oh, but I had my speech all planned. Listen to this. First thing you gotta do is forget everything this guy Lattimore has told you, because it's a bunch of bull. <laughs> You're Lieutenant Dowling, aren't you? Yeah. Uh, Mike, this is Robert Miner, the student I was telling you about. Oh, right. The one that thinks writer's innocent. So, how's your investigation going? Well, uh, did you know that Mrs. Ryder was planning to leave her husband? Oh. Yeah, she was cheating on him. That's why I killed her. Well, she took a lease on an apartment in town. Really? Yeah, I spoke to the apartment manager. I, I saw the lease. I just don't remember reading about that in the report. Hey, this kid's on the ball. Well, it just makes Ryder's motive even stronger. She wants to leave, he just tries to stop her. If he did it. <laughs> okay. How do you explain the autopsy files being in the Ryder house? I think somebody planted them there. Ah, gee, we're doing all right up until then. That's far too speculative. Roger's prints were never found on those files. Gloves. And that is the only prints the police ever found belong to Professor Lattimore. Uh-oh. Looks like I arrested the wrong guy. Uh, Come on, I hate to break things up here, but I have to get back to the office. Can you give me a lift? Well, it depends. Got to handcuff you to the cage. <laughs> Look, I didn't mean to accuse him. He was teasing, Robert. He was teasing. Yeah. Stop it. Come on. Let's hey, go. Good meeting you. Good luck. Thanks. Hey! you. Yes, I got your note. Look, I will not let you do this to me. Yeah, all right. All right. Laura? Is that you? Uh-huh. Robert gave me your note. I'll be right out. Can you believe it? The place hasn't changed in 15 years. Wow. 
Why don't you make yourself comfortable? You remember the first time we came here? You were so nervous because you thought your father was following us? Huh? And then when we got here, you hid in the bathroom for an hour. You remember that? Everything okay in there? Everything's just fine. Comfortable? This was worth waiting for. You don't know how much I miss this, you know that? What do you think you were doing? When you gave the assignment, I thought, what better victim than Professor Lattimore? Definitely a character haunted by his past, to be specific. A sordid affair with a student that broke up an otherwise happy marriage. How did you get this information? There aren't a lot of secrets in a college town. <sighs> what about giving the police an alternate suspect? Otherwise, they might actually do some detective work. I've taken care of that. You can read all about it in my paper. Oh, but I forgot. You won't be around by then. So, how about it, Professor? Do I shoot you right here in cold blood and commit the perfect murder? Or do I spare your life and get an A? <laughs> an A? Remedial studies is more like it. Before you shoot, take a look at that envelope over there. To be opened in the event of my death or disappearance. I know, it's cliche. Look, read on. This is to notify the authorities that I may have endangered my life by agreeing to meet Francesca Levin at the Darkett Cove Motel. So on and so forth. The original is in a place where it can easily be discovered by the police. You broke the first rule of the mystery writer. Never let your reader get ahead of you. When Robert gave me the note, I had a pretty good idea it was a fake. How? The phrase, please don't tell anyone, is completely out of character for Laura. If she'd really decided to meet me here, she would have told Potter first. How did you get Robert to uh, deliver the note? Oh, you know, guys like that. All I had to do was bat my eyes at him a few times. And the gun? I waited in the department office until the janitor left. I lied about the bullets, though. The gun was empty. I lied, too. There was no copy. If you knew all along it was me, why did you come here? I never walk away from a challenge. I was just reminded of something you said in class. What was that? possibility of romance always gives the story an added element of suspense. I know. A character in conflict with himself. I guess you could call it that. I've got to get back.
By the way, uh, there were a few other calling cards you left lying around. Like what? Fingerprints for one. You touch the bathroom door and the light switch. I could have wiped them off. Yes, assuming you remembered everything you touched. Even someone with the most casual interest in crime. I would tell you that you would have been a lot safer wearing gloves. What about the body? I guess you were just going to leave it lying here in the room. Why not? No one knew I was here. Ah, but you failed to realize that a murder and an affair bring about an entirely different set of circumstances. There's a lot the authorities might overlook. <laughs> yes, but a, a warm body gives the police a head start. Most of murder, any detail comes under incredible scrutiny. Oh, Francesca. Francesca, come on, come on. Um, hello, is um, Mike Dowling there, please? person I expected to see. Since when did you get up before nine? Oh, I'm just, uh, just getting a jump on the day. What are you up to? Nothing. I could always tell when you were hiding something. Huh. By the way, it looks like one of your students got a head start on the perfect murder assignment. What do you mean? Well, there was a paper put in my mailbox by mistake. What did that say? Some scheme about a young woman tricking an older man into a romantic rendezvous. Sound familiar? It's got a great twist in it, though. See, the man is not the real target. The girl is. Someone else kills her, leaving the innocent man to deal with the body. Isn't that clever? It's, uh, it's uh, preposterous. Well, I kind of like the way it ends. Finally, the sad, frustrated man has been inexorably drawn into the crime by virtue of his broken heart. I'll read it, okay? Thanks. We found this in the bathroom, Lieutenant. Thanks. Her name was Francesca Lavin. Yeah, I know. I better go notify the college. important decisions the mystery writer faces is the motive that he gives to his murderer. 
Now, motives generally fall under a few basic categories, like... Revenge? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. A very common motive. The killer might want to right an old wrong or settle a score. Depending on his psychological makeup, it might take nothing more than a playful insult to bring his murderous impulses to the surface. What about jealousy? Also good. I mean, not all of us are as smart or as rich or as beautiful as we'd like to be. I mean, sometimes this can create feelings of rage which fester and grow until we feel the need to lash out at someone who possesses the qualities we think we lack. How about greed? Uh, greed! Now, that covers a wide range of motives. People could be greedy for money or fame or career advancement. I've even heard of a student who would kill to get an A on a paper. Of course, we haven't mentioned what motivates the vast majority of murders. Love, but I will guess we get to that next time. Uh, there's an article I'd like you all to read at the top of my desk. Please pick one up. Uh, Robert, uh, that note you passed on, when did my wife give it to you? Um, yesterday morning, after the Milton seminar. Thanks. Lattimore? Oh, hi. Oh, hi, Mike. What's going on? I got some bad news, Charlie. One of your students was found murdered last night. By Jessica Lavin. Oh, God. How did this happen? She was strangled. Doc at Cove Motel. I uh, told Lieutenant Dowling that it might have something to do with your assignment. Well, that was very thoughtful of you. Think it's possible, Charlie? Of course not. That assignment was just a mental exercise. Oh, come on. A room full of people planning the perfect murder? I knew something like this would happen. Pray, do you mean? I hope your new book makes you lots of money, Charles. Because your academic career is coming to a close. Uh, Henry, why don't you let me talk to Charlie alone? Huh? I'll be waiting for you in my office. I don't think he likes you too much. Mm. So, uh, how's class going? Fine. And, uh, until now. Well, Potter does have a point, you know. What do you mean? Well, what is it you tell your students? Given the right set of circumstances, anyone's capable of murder? Well, maybe you provided them with the right set of circumstances. Oh, Mike. All I'm saying is you may have unleashed something that you can't control here. It's fine to be careful, okay? Okay. I met Francesca. You at the party. She was a beautiful girl. She was attractive, yes. She was attractive, yes. She was a knockout. You didn't have anything going with her, did you? Come on, Mike. Hey, I'm just doing my job, Charlie. Besides, I know what it's like for a guy in your position. Oh, really? What is it like, exactly? Huh? Well, come on, Charlie. You and I both of us wouldn't be the first time. What are you talking about? What are you trying to say? Nothing. But if I did need to know where you were, like for some weird reason, I'm sure you could tell me, couldn't you? Yes, yes, I could. But since I sat home alone all night correcting papers, it wouldn't be much of an alibi, now would it? Mike, am I a suspect? I'm not saying that you are. No, but you're not saying I'm not either. Forget it. Uh, Lavin girl seemed like she got around. Uh, who knows? Maybe she fell in with the wrong bunch of guys, right? Yeah. What's this? What? This book. It's uh, the big sleeve. Raymond Chandler. Can I borrow it? <sighs> Why? You hate detective stories. Yeah, but I've been having some insomnia lately, and I figure maybe if I read, I'll fall asleep. Well, just because it's called the big sleeve, Mike, doesn't mean it's boring. Well, great. Then maybe I'll have some fun while I'm staying up on it. Can I borrow the book, Charlie? Thanks. You all right? Yeah, I'm fine, man. You sure? Sure. All right. Thanks. Hey, and if you think of anything, give me a call. I'm worried about you. Thanks. <laughs>
Who's there? Why did you kill Francesca Lavin? What, what are you talking about? My wife didn't give you that note. Francesca did. Which means you were the only other person who knew that she was at that motel last night. All, all right, I, I admit it. I lied to you, but that doesn't mean I killed her. Prove it. You, you mean an alibi? That would be a very good start, yes. All right. According to radio reports, the murder took place between 8 and 10. That's exactly when I was attending Professor Commenter's class in the 19th century English novel. That's a very large lecture course. You could have easily slipped out the back without being noticed. True. Except that last night's class featured a paper delivered by yours truly. Yeah. Sorry to disappoint you. I take it the police don't know that you're at the motel. No. But it's not going to take them long to figure that one out, is it? So your only hope is to find the killer before they arrest you. Something like that. Well, maybe I can help you. You know, play uh, Watson or your homes. Uh, thanks, but I don't think so. I'd uh, really like to. Or, or I could save the police a lot of legwork. All I have to do is tell them about the nut. So we have a deal, right? Good. Okay. Now, the way I see it, we should just look at this as another assignment. Now, first, we should remember something that you said in class the other day. What was that? Figure out who stands to gain the most from the murder, and that's probably the person who did it. Now, if you're implicated in the crime, you're, you're through at Hempstead. I don't think the privilege is a tenure with murder. I can think of at least one person who wouldn't mind attending your going away party. Professor Henry Potter. To say nothing of how Laura will take the news about my being in a motel with a beautiful undergraduate. Looks like we have a match. I don't know. I don't know. I can't see Potter killing someone just to get me out of his hair unless... I overheard Potter on the phone last night. He said, I got your note. I'm not going to let you do this. At first, I thought it was Laura breaking the news that she was going to meet me at the motel. But what if it wasn't Laura? What if someone else was threatening him? Francesca Lavin. But what does she have on him? I don't know. But I have a good idea where to find out. Yeah. What do you got? The print. It was on the headboard. Way to go to Fazio. Check it against the student, student files. Student files at the college. I did already. It came up blank. So you want to do the FBI hot shot? Yeah. Another dead end. I guess we're looking at a first timer. All right. Look. Something I want you to do for me. Sure, boss. Run the print against this. Like I said, they match. Call me first. No, you call me only. Got it. Got it. Francesca Lavin. It's so awful. Yes, I know. Uh, did you see Potter last night? God, Charlie, one of your students just died, and all you care about is my love life? Humor me. No, I did not see Henry. We had a date, but he canceled. When? I don't know. About six. There's a rumor going around that you were having an affair with Francesca. Is it true? No. 
Would you care if it was, though? All set. I'll take it in here, babe. Hello. Hi, boss. It's me. Sweetheart, go we'll play with your sisters for a while, all right? Okay, give me a kiss. We'll do this in a little while. What'd you find out? You were right. The prints on the book match the ones at the motel. Okay. I'll sit on it till the morning. Mike? What's up? I think Charlie's in some kind of trouble. Do you really need that? Yeah. Come on, dinner's ready. Where did you learn to do this? Research for my first novel. I interviewed a jewel thief named Fingers Franco. Fingers, Frankel. I swear, that was a real name. Fingers said the trick was to kick the lock without actually breaking it. You know, I'm almost done with my writer paper. Uh -huh. Did you find a real killer yet? Yeah, it was definitely the boyfriend. See, when Ann Reiner decided that she was leaving her husband, she told him he got scared. He came over that morning to break off the affair. They fought, and the lover stabbed her. Mm -hmm. Then he tried to make it look like the work of the serial killers. Not realizing at that very moment that they were being arrested down in Florida. Right. He screwed up. So he had to frame someone else before the police got any closer. And that's why he put those files over at Ryder's house. Yeah, Ryder's been trying to sell that story for years. Unfortunately, no one's ever come up with enough evidence to back it up. The files were in Ryder's desk at his house, right? When he opened it to show you the paper he'd written for the AMA review, you saw it, and then you asked to see the files. How did you know it was an AMA article? It was in the book. No, it wasn't. I left that detail out. I must have read it in an interview. Oh. Let's have a look at this. Dear Francesca, I've never experienced anything as powerful as what happened between us last night. It was the greatest dream of my life. This is revolting. So he's sleeping with her, huh? Mm, not something the head of the English department is supposed to do. Well, especially wants to hold on to your wife. Meet me at Plumbers Park at 8, Francesca. It was all part of her perfect murder. She'd lure Potter to the park, leaving him without an alibi for the hours when the murder took place. Except he decided to follow her instead. Exactly. So what's next? The confession scene. You think you can put this in the professor's box? You bet. Hello. Hello, Mike. It's me. Are you asleep? Yeah. <laughs> First night without insomnia in a month. I'm glad you called. Listen, I better say this straight out, even though it'll probably cost me my job. I found your print at that motel. I was there, Mike, but I didn't kill her. Look, why don't you meet me at the station first thing in the morning? No. Be at the old college theater at 10. Why? I'm going to hand over Francesca Lavin's killer. Damn it, Charlie. This is not some murder game you're playing here. A student is dead. Be there. The mood at Hampstead College today remains somber in the aftermath of co-ed Francesca Lavin's murder. Police say they have no suspects in the strangulation death of Miss Lavin, 20. 
Late yesterday, large numbers of concerned parents arrived at the school, fearful for their children's safety. College administrators are urging both parents and students to remain calm. Police have told them that the crime does not appear to be the work of a serial killer. Good morning, Mary. Good morning, Professor. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Mary, I need those copies by 3 o'clock. They'll be there. Great. I heard a very interesting story about a sister professor stayed. Is anything wrong? No, nothing. Is anybody here? I don't know who you are. I got your note. Breaking into school property is a major offense. And guilty parties are usually suspended. But perhaps we can uh, talk about it. Pretend like it never happened? Oh, it's you. What are you doing here? Good thriller. Uh, chase scene. Um, uh, imagine our hero as a fugitive from justice, hotly pursued by the forces of law and order for a crime he didn't commit. He finds himself trapped on the upper floor of a building with no obvious means of escape, and he needs your help. 
Any ideas? Yes. Maybe he could shoot his way out. No weapons. He could jump out the window. Too high. What if he just walks out? Charlie, open the door. There's nowhere you can go. Okay, fine. Blow it. Charlie. <laughs> I can't believe you guys fell for it. Let's go. Want to take a look? Oh, come on. Don't you have anything better to do? She belong to you? It's my brother's. Do you mind? Okay. Move along. Trunk is open. Thank you. Where are we? A few miles from school. Before we go any further, I want to know what happened. I didn't kill him. You have to believe that. You see... Oh, oh. See, this is all so complicated. I thought Potter killed Francesca. What? All the evidence pointed to him. Oh, how could I have been so dense? I teach this to my students all the time. But the most obvious suspect is hardly ever the actual... Charlie! Villain. Who killed Henry? Robert Minor. Oh, come on. I know Robert. I find that hard to believe that someone so... so harmless would all of a sudden go on a murder spree. Why would he do it? I think I know. We have to get into his dorm room. What? Are you crazy? The campus is crawling with cops. Laurel, we can do this. Will you just get in the car and trust me, please? No! No. Uh, 
Laura. Laura. I don't know what to say. I really don't. Except that I'm sorry. Oh, it made Henry so unhappy. Are you kidding? You were the best thing ever to happen to him. Oh, no, not after last night. I told him that it was over that. That I was in love with someone else. Oh, come on. No, come on. no. Come on, no, I'm sorry. I, I, I just don't know if I can believe you. Come on, let's just go, okay? For you, I'm tutoring a floor counselor who dozes off during calculus long form. I'll wait in the lobby. Super extension you wanted? Yeah. Some of the research in the Ryder case. How does he know Tim Ryder? I can't tell you how much your love and support have meant to me. I'm totally confused. Maybe this will help you. It's Robert's latest letter. Looks like you didn't have time to post it. Dear Uncle Tim, I've figured it out. I know who killed Aunt Anne. Tim Ryder is Robert Miner's uncle? Not Robert Miner. Robert Michener. Tim is a married sister who lives in Iowa. I tried to talk to her, but she always refused. So Ryder's getting back at you through Robert. M.D. Come on. We have one more person to see. Who? Tim Ryder. attorney worked it all out. You have 15 minutes with him tomorrow morning. You're going in as Joseph Pomerantz. Great. Do you have any idea how risky this is? I mean, all, all Ryder has to do is snap his fingers and, and you'll be arrested. I know. Why are you doing it? I owe it to him, Laura. thinking a lot about what you said. What? You know, about the book changing me. You were right. All my instincts told me right I was innocent. But then I found those files. As a writer, it was my job to tell the truth, right? So I took everything Ryder told me including things he told me as a friend, and created this portrait of a killer. But you knew I didn't believe it. You knew I was betraying my gut feeling in the name of some journalistic truth. After a while, that's all I could see in your eyes. I started looking away. The 
fact is, Ryder probably did kill his wife. I don't think so. But you searched long and hard for any evidence that would clear him. Maybe not hard enough. hours in the gym every day. I never went in for physical exercise before, but now, now I love it. You know, when my lawyer told me that you had some new evidence to discuss, I know it was another one of your deceptions, but then I thought, no, let him come. Let him see what he's done for me. I didn't put you in here, Tim. The jury did that. You helped. You want to know what the worst thing that ever happened to me was? And he's dead. <laughs> but can I tell you the second worst thing? It wasn't my conviction. And it certainly wasn't being put in here. No, that, that simplified my life. No. It was losing you. The idea that you actually believed I murdered my wife. I know that Robert Miner is your nephew. He's very smart, isn't he? I hear he's in your class. I guess you also know that one of my students has been murdered. Robert mentioned it. He said the police think you killed her. Did you tell him? No. But you can't prove it, right? Mm -hmm. How does that make you feel? Frustrated? Angry? Or does it all seem so unfair that it takes everything in your power just to keep from exploding? Come on, Ryder, you've had your fun. Now call Robert off before someone else dies. You think I orchestrated this? Didn't you? Oh, that's perfect. You get yourself in trouble and you blame me. Sorry, Lattimore. You're not going to pin another murder on me. Tim. Where did you get that? From Robert. Why didn't you ever tell me about this before? There are some things I kept private, even from you. After reading your book, I'm glad I did. And I really love this pin. She wore it every day. When did you buy it for her? I didn't. She got it herself about a year before she died. She was always so proud of my being a surgeon. And why did she have an affair? I was far from the perfect husband. I think she was just trying to get back at me. You understand about that, don't you, Charlie? You used to talk a lot about your marital troubles in the old days. Of course, that was only a ploy to get me to open up. Pretend to be on their side and they'll tell you anything. Isn't that it? Isn't that the way it works? Can I borrow that for a couple of days? Why? I'd rather not say. Why not? Doesn't mean anything anymore. Uh, by the way, your nephew has disappeared off the campus. Do you have any idea where he might be? 
Oh, come on, Charlie. You're the great detective. Think about it. Tim, I'm very, very sorry for everything. You should be, Charlie. Come on, get me out of here. Ryder hasn't been able to unload the property. People get spooked when they find out someone was murdered there. I don't think he was there. Uh, look. If anything goes wrong, it's all in here. Charlie, if something happens to you. Trust me, this is going to work. A couple of coffees and uh, it's Latimer. All right, move out. Come on. Take car 16. Get me Lieutenant Dowling. his uncle. No, he got at it first, I thought Ryder had put him up to it. But then I found out Robert had planned the whole thing by himself. It's not true. I didn't kill anybody. Look, there's only one person who could have pulled this off. 
Well, it's just like you said in class. The least likely suspect is always the guilty party. I mean, don't you see? It's him. He's outsmarted you every step of the way. There's no doubt in my mind that he did it. It's my Howley. <laughs> All right, yeah, sure. First it was you, Charlie. Now it's me. Nice try, kid. Look, think about it. Only a cop could have enough information to duplicate the cult murders. Right? Come on. Charlie, let's go down to the station before this gets any crazier. Dowling was the one who was having the affair with my aunt. She threatened to tell his wife. So he came over that morning in order to reason with her. But then they started to argue. You son of a bitch! You lied. I never promised you anything. You said you didn't, Dowling. Come on, Hank. Dowling's first instinct was to make it look like a serial killer. When that didn't work, see, he blamed it on Uncle Tim. But he knew that the evidence was pretty flimsy. So he planted those files where he knew you would find them. It's a waste of time. No, 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 no. Let him finish. He knew that people would be influenced by your conclusions about the case. And one thing he counted on was that you'd never suspect him. And he was right. Even if this is all true, I still don't understand how it connects with Francesca's death or Potter's. Well, you see, that was my fault. See, once he found out that I was reopening the investigation for the class, he knew he'd have to stop me. Now, he could have killed me, but then he'd run the risk of someone making the connection between the two cases. So he decided to, to shut down the class. And he was sure that Francesca's death would do that, but see, you did something unexpected. You didn't call the police. I've had enough of this. Sit down, Mike. Sit down. Go on. So when you built a case against Potter, Dowling knew he was in trouble. I mean, an arrest, an investigation, it would drag on for months. And none of this was going to solve his problem. He still had to stop me right away. So he killed Potter. This time with the police standing right outside the door. I was one of the investigating officers. Charlie, you're going to believe this creep over me? How would we know each other? Don't trust him. He's not going to let us leave here alive. Other than Robert, you were the only person to know that Potter was at the theater that night, Mike. That's it. Well, shoot me if you want to, Charlie. I'm out of here. Mike, I don't care if you shoot me, Charlie. Mike, listen. Mike, you can't do this! Mike! Oh! Oh! Charlie! Oh! I would. Hey, Mike, 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 you can't do this. Get it. Sit down. Tie the kid up. You need to tie the kid up. Tie the kid up. All right, okay, okay. Come on, Mike. Okay, now what? Charlie, you're the expert. Write this scene for me. Sorry, Mike, I don't want to be part of this game. Oh, you have no choice. Well, the police outside the door. It's going to be pretty difficult to kill us both and uh, get away with it. True. As I see it, you're going to do one thing, Mike. What? Give yourself up. <laughs> give myself up? That's the best you can do? I've killed three people. I can just give myself up? Oh, I got it. Okay. How's this for the perfect murder? I came in. You made me tie the kid up. And then you shot him. I like that. No. Sorry, kid. Oh, no, my, my, my. Oh. Oh. Final chapter. Ah. Police, drop it. Drop it. Drop the oh, gun. This, please. Just, okay, okay. Up, oh, the gun's going, the gun's going down. Gun, it's down, okay? Charlie Lattimore is responsible for the deaths of Francesco Levin and Henry Potter. And he just killed the kid. Book him. Okay, let's get the paramedics in here and call off that backup unit. I'll make the call. Yes, sir. I'll do it right away. Lieutenant! Uh, 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 hi. Oh, just a few props, courtesy of the drama department. Planks, stage blood. Oh, and, um, tape recorder. <laughs> Give myself up. That's the best you can do. I've killed three people! I'm afraid you got the wrong man. How did you know? MD. 
Not medical doctor. Mike Dowling. Just like the one you gave your wife. Boss, we better go down to the station. You know, you always told us to hold off revealing the villain for as long as possible. It's a little too close for comfort. Uh, you know what else I always say? Mm. Once the villain is revealed, the story's over. When we uh, started this course eight months ago, I said that each one of you would learn how to write a decent thriller by the end of the year. Well, I'm happy to report that my prediction was more than cautious. You've all produced outstanding work, absolutely outstanding. Especially this. Has anyone seen Robert? No. Anyway, uh, congratulations and have a great summer. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Uh, John, John. Uh, when you see Robert, will you make sure he gets this? Sure thing, Professor. I don't see what the rush is. Remember what happened to us on the way to our first honeymoon? Yes, I remember. That's all right. right. Okay. Ah, I got it. Got you. Oh, slow uh, down, Robert. Yeah. My book. Your book. Your book is excellent. I read it in one sitting. I did have a problem with some of your personal descriptions, mind you. Am I really sitting on the side, darling? Yes, darling. Right. See, I, I sent the manuscript off to an agent in New York a couple months ago. It's going to be published. That's fantastic. I'm going to dedicate it to Uncle Tim. Oh, very good. How's he doing? Great. Great. I, I just spoke to him in California. He, oh. he said to say hello. Good. Well, listen, congratulations. You know, it's not going to be much money, but what a thrill just to have it published all the same. Oh, uh, well, actually, <laughs> this is a really amazing part. Uh, it's already been sold to the movies. Oh, you're kidding. No. I, the fee is in the low six figures. I mean... It's not much by Hollywood standards, but it's still a lot more than I've ever seen before. Oh. Or you, Charlie. Well, thanks for pointing them out, dude. Oh, hmm. well, I wonder who will play me. Maybe Myrtle Streep. Myrtle? Myrtle Streep. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. Myrtle, uh, Myrtle Sticks. I... Myrtle Streep. Sorry. Okay, everybody, uh, back to one. Let's go. Right, 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 right now. Right now. Then one day I knew our love was really over. It was over. Ending like a fair. With the sun, now the end of winter turns to spring, and I find.